This is Writers Not Writing, the show where you can get to know your favorite writers and soon-to-be favorite writers by listening to them confess to the ways they procrastinate. Thanks for procrastinating with us. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff. Doug tries his best to make me sound better. And each week we have a secret word to listen for. If you catch it, you earn the right to take an extra break at the time of your choosing from whatever is stressing you out. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Today's secret word is space casino. Welcome, everyone. Today's guest is Beth Barani, uh, award-winning author. Beth Barani writes in several genres, including young adult adventure fantasy, paranormal romance, and science fiction mysteries. Inspired by living abroad in France and Quebec, she loves creating magical tales of romance, mystery, and adventure that empower women and girls to be heroes of their own lives. For fun, Beth enjoys walking her neighborhood, gardening on her patio, and watching movies and traveling with her husband, author Ezra Barani. They live in Oakland, California, with a piano, over a thousand books, and usually demanding sweet cats. When Beth is in writing, she runs a business coaching and teaching science fiction and fiction writers, and also teaches tailored story writing curricula for future-facing, bold organizations who want members to think outside the box and take action. Creativity is the answer. Welcome, Beth. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Benjamin. So happy to be here. So folks who regularly watch the show know that we completely dress up in cosplay as you have done today, but for the sake of the podcast listeners, we have to explain what it is we're wearing. So tell everybody about your costume. That's fantastic. Yes. Uh, black leather, coat, pants, you know, motorcycle chaps, boots. The helmet is here, raring to go. So the whole flight suit. That's right. That's excellent. Well, I wanted to I, I wanted to, to get in the, the, the same kind of uh, vein there, but uh, I have nostalgia for the 1980s astronaut craze. I mean, that's, you know, early 80s growing up, I aspired to be an astronaut. And so I rented, I could not afford, but I rented this old fashioned 80s spacesuit, which is very cumbersome, but uh, there's a lot of nostalgia in here with me. Uh, I am... I am channeling. I, I when I was a kid, Sally Ride was my hero. I even had a a, a picture. My my mother reached out to Sally Ride, and I had an autographed picture of of Sally mm. Ride. So uh, well, I'm not cool. quite sure what the connection was there. I think my my mother knew her the parents of her wife or something, uh -huh. and so there was some kind of connection there. But uh, yeah, it was it was really wow. cool. I got to you know set, she, she was amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Well, that's great. So this is a show about procrastination, what we do when we're not writing. So what's a bit of pop culture that's been uh, grabbing your attention this week when you're not writing? Oh, geez. Um, well, I know I had to brainstorm all of this ahead of time, but I can't even remember what I wrote, but I'll just remember what, what pops in my mind is I'm I'm always curious what the latest discoveries are in science. So mm. I'm always watching um, YouTube videos about it. And I think we... And my husband's a high school physics teacher. So we'll watch stuff together and I'll have him like explain it to me if I don't understand something. So there was something in the news that we were watching. Oh, it came out like some report last week or the week before. And we were watching explainer videos about it. Um, you know, I'm super fascinated by the expansion of the universe that's supposed to be accelerating. And we're all mm -hmm. like, wow, well, could that be? And then like our dark holes, you know, our black holes, dark energy, like, is that for real? There's these, you know, two science reports that came out and different science explainers going on about them. And all of them basically saying, you know, correlation is not causation. Right. Like there seems to be some correlation, but until, and it's very hard to do experiments because we can't go to a black hole. So yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw something about this, about um, uh, it was somebody who was manipulating uh, potentially manipulating dark energy, the, the theory anyway, this kind of works on the computer, this works in modeling, uh, of essentially teleporting something, teleporting energy. Uh, and it was really interesting. The, per the person managed to create what I am understanding to be, and I could be misunderstanding this, an energy vacuum of some kind, and then nature abhorring a vacuum 
shunted energy from one place to another into this space. And so, the, you know, the, the practical applications are really wild. Could we, and, it, you know, it was, it was moved microns. Like <laughs> this was not, you know, moved over great distances yet. But yeah. the idea is that in theory, anyway, you could create a, a space and move energy into it, which I thought was really fascinating. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, yeah, that whole idea of energy from the vacuum and the Casimir effect, it's fascinating. And I, I do not pretend to understand it, but I have used it right. in my storytelling. Yeah, oh, fun. you have, good. You've mm -hmm. already been playing with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, that's, uh, I, I, I enjoy that kind of, you know, hard sci-fi twist within, I, I tend to read stuff that's about, you know, I, I, it's technically soft sci-fi, but I think a lot of people don't understand. That just means the soft sciences, right? So it's mm. economics, it's it's psychology, those kinds of uh, science fiction. You know, you put people in a spaceship, but you're really looking at how they interact with one another. It's a it's a soft sci-fi novel, but I mm. love when there's some hard sci-fi in there and it's exploring. You know, how does this ship work? Well, it's moving energy from place to place, so that's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really interesting. And, you know, it's hard for me to say that I'm not writing because all the times that I'm not writing, I'm researching um, passions, things that interest me from psychology to uh, philosophy to uh, different personality typing systems to science, uh, history, archaeology. So it's like whatever grabs my fancy. And I read a ton of headlines and then I pick up, just sort of follow my nose and dive read a whole article on something uh, it's so random and and it's yeah. super fun but it really is part of the process like that Absolutely. consumption of ideas is part of the writing process totally totally and i love listening to weekly reports about the space industry so i you know there are several people who do the reports what launched what failed to launch uh, and i love watching them i love listening to them i actually listen to youtube videos more than i watch them because oh, yeah. I'm very auditory focused. So, uh, and I'm just also absorbing, I'm absorbing language. I'm absorbing how people talk about things. And yeah. um, after listening to so many launches, you know, I incorporate that into my language of my characters and it's, it's really fun. I love watching those videos of the successful launches, watching the people in the, uh, in the, you know, in the control room yeah. and their, their celebrations, you know, and that these are people who are so brilliant and the stuff that they are, are working with is stuff that, you know, I would not even fully comprehend. And yet that feeling I can totally mm -hmm. embrace, you know, yeah. it worked, whatever it was, it worked. <laughs> yeah. Especially difficult things like the Mars landing yeah. or, or the asteroid blowing up the asteroid, you know, to, or, to move it or, you know, the Artemis mission. Um, yes. I remember running down the hall to a colleague and saying, you know, we, we need to understand how amazing this was that we, you know, hit a bullet with a tinier bullet in space. <laughs> like this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, potentially earth saving uh, in, mm -hmm. in terms of what we learned. Uh, that's so cool. You know, and one colleague was like, you're a nerd. And another was like, no, you're right. That's so <laughs> cool. You know, uh huh. At yeah. some point, uh, this this could save us all, and the science is so advanced. So that that was a really cool success. Yeah, so amazing. And I I also listened to interviews with different experts in the field. I recently listened to an interview about um, the future of of they didn't say it like I think they called them the spaceways. So the whole low low Earth orbit, medium, high Earth orbit, the space between the Earth and the Moon. So that's where I'm playing in as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And they had such an interesting perspective and brought in some cross cultural ideas that made me want to study um, not just um, what are the different decisions that different countries are making about the space industry, but how they make those decisions. Because their their big point was the U.S. doesn't understand how these other countries make their decisions. They don't mm. understand their strategy, uh, decision-making behavior. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what is it? You know, how do, how how can we summarize how these different countries in, especially China and um, also U UAE um, and Luxembourg and the U.S. and Russia, those are the big players. Oh, and India. In India now, yeah. What, what drives their decision-making process? You know, so that got me really curious and I'm like, ah, aha, a new topic to, to, to dive into. <laughs> yeah. And kind of what are their time horizons? You know, what, what are their goals? You know, mm -hmm. what, uh, we tend to be 
you know, very much this, this has to happen now and we need to plant a flag and we need to claim it. And I think a lot of other countries are saying our, our goals are also nationalistic. I know India under, under Modi is still, you know, it, it, it's a it, very much, we want to plant a flag, but the time frame might be very different. So I know China is much, you know, more patient. Uh, yes. You know, they're, they're willing to, to, uh, to, to, they want to be there, but they're not saying we need to be first to they're saying we need to, you know, catch up and, and be best and we can take our time to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. They make five-year plans and, uh, yeah, that doesn't happen in the United States. Yeah, yeah. So that, well, I mean, and part of it is if you know you're going to be the dictator for a long period of time, you don't have to think in terms of four year and two year cycles. So uh, mm-hmm. that, that, you know, you can do some long term, the, 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 the advantages of dictatorship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I have been really concerned, uh, kind of one of the things that's been jumping out at me is uh, that these, uh, I've been seeing reports from teachers in Florida who have had to uh, essentially eliminate their classroom libraries because of the censorship there. And, and you know, any reference to, it's so broad that any reference to racism is considered potentially a problem. Uh, and the teachers, in abundance of caution, just say, oh, OK, when in doubt, I'm going to put this away or any really any reference to uh, queer relationships. Oh, this this book, it might, you know, get me charged with a felony. I would rather not take that risk. And so I think we as writers need to really watch the way kind of the the, the administrative state can be chilling without actually enforcing anything, just creating the danger that work might be, pro- you know, uh, create a fight can really impinge on uh, the writer's ability to get their work to certain readers, especially kids. So that's something I've been, you know, mm. doing a lot of uh, uh, screaming and yelling about and trying to get people's attention to the fact that the, even without prosecuting anyone, they are preventing mm-hmm. a lot of books from getting into a lot of kids' hands. I'll tell everybody yeah. that's something to watch out for. Yeah, I I do all that I can to raise the signal around the issues of book banning. And actually, one of my writers just uh, it was relayed to me today. Her goal is to write a, a young a middle grade fantasy that gets banned. Like that's yeah. her goal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, there is the flip side. Well, you know, right. I, one of my first novels uh, has Muhammad as a character. And uh, I was, you know, concerned that, you know, uh-huh. somebody was going to freak out and say, this is, you know, you're depicting the prophet, mm-hmm. uh, you know, not not in a way that is insulting by any stretch, but, uh, you know, is fictionalized and that would uh, offend certain people. And then there was a part of me saying, and also for sales purposes, that might not be all bad. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, some writers I know, uh, I live with one who, who likes to put controversy into mm-hmm. his work for the purpose of um getting attention but not not just as a gimmick but out of sincerity as well well and that's, yeah, that the, is the tension is this mm-hmm. is this just here to you know poke people and kind of bait them or is this something you really ra- want to wrestle with and, mm-hmm. and at the same time knowing the, the controversy isn't all bad for for getting attention so yeah i don't i don't do it consciously but i recognize i mean i'm writing about adult themes i'm writing murder mysteries they're, they're not all sweet and pretty and um, I have diverse characters and people of yeah, all stripes, well, you know. And it is uh, wild that things that I would not have considered controversial even a decade ago. You know, I, I, I teach about anti-racism in the exact same way I have for the last 20 years. And only now are people saying, this is CRT. And I'm like, CRT is a third year law school class. I am not qualified to teach <laughs> the mm-hmm. actual CRT but I do teach that racism is, you know, that institutional racism exists and is uh, something we can address. And that alone is enough that some folks go, oh, you, you're, you're, you know, proselytizing to students about, you know, or just teaching American history accurately uh, has become controversial in a way that it was not in my classroom 20 years ago. So that's been wild to watch but yeah and you've got um so when you're writing mysteries and you're you know thinking about those characters are you thinking about diversity in an active way or are you just saying these are the people who were there um well because my stories take place on space stations there's people from all over the planet and i'm just kind of following my instincts around what it is i want to be addressing um i do something similar that a lot of mystery shows do which is Often the people who die, not always, but often they aren't necessarily nice people. 
and you know their crimes come to life as we investigate their murders. I mean, we still want justice for them. My heroine still wants justice, but we also discover that their behavior wasn't always um, the best. Uh, and so it's it's like shades of gray. I'm like, they're human, they're people, they're not always great. So there's that struggle, like what yeah. is right, what is wrong. Um, I'm not, I think a lot about diversity with my cast um, of characters, you know, even my main character who looks white, I have her with a diverse background, growing up speaking Spanish, um, having, you know, a mixed race background, just like me, um, where people look at you and they're like, wait, where are you from? And you're yeah. like, well, here, 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 and here. Oh, and here. <laughs> you know, like, it isn't one thing. You know, I, I grew up knew, knowing that I was of multiple backgrounds. And yeah, most of it's Jewish, but then there's the Irish and the Native American. And, you know, oh, a tiny bit of Asian. Like, okay, cool. We're American. Great. We were just talking about this in my class. I, I also am Jewish, Irish, mm -hmm. mostly mm -hmm. Jewish, Irish, uh, uh, Scottish, and then Eastern, you know, Eastern European and a bunch of Portuguese uh, <laughs> on my on my dad's side. And and yet I acknowledge that I am white presenting and mm -hmm. that Ju my Judaism is something that, uh, you know, I have certainly seen an uptick in anti-Semitic sentiment, but that is something I can choose to share or not share. And mm -hmm. that is something that because I am white presenting and whiteness has, you know, this abstract uh, human construct concept of race whiteness has been afforded to me in a way that it was not to my grandmother and mm -hmm. to my great grandfather, uh, certainly. Uh, and so that is a, you know, and, and on my, uh, maternal grandfather's side, you know, his Irishness, he was not white, mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, whiteness has now been afforded to me. So that is an interesting mm -hmm. thing to consider for our characters too. If they are white presenting, what does that mm -hmm. afford them? And how do they mm -hmm. wrestle with the tension of, you know, knowing if they were not white presenting, would they be experiencing this interaction with another character differently? Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that I, I you know, do play mm -hmm. with. I've got a character, my, my protagonist in the series I'm writing right now is uh, Afro-Latina. She's mm -hmm. a, a black and uh, Argentinian, uh, Argentinian mm -hmm. or, or her parents. And uh, she has to explain to her white girlfriend I, I recognize that in the United States, I'm just black. Like that mm -hmm. is the way that I present. Mm -hmm. And so my treatment is that I am black. My Argentinian heritage is something I am choosing to kind of hold on to. So that that's, I think mm -hmm. that is an interesting thing for us to think about with our characters and, and you know, create that diversity. But you're right, it, ha it, it can't feel forced, right? Mm -hmm. You know, these are just the people who are there. That's right. And uh, I'm playing more with the rich poor divide and the wrong side of the tracks and the right side of the tracks and who gets access to what. And um, also kind of like what power, power struggles, power structures, things like that. Uh, and also my heroine has a basically a bionic eye and has to deal with the, the um, and it's kind of hidden. So, but if people know, like she's supposed to keep it on the down low because it is part of her work and, uh, she had to sign all these papers saying she wouldn't use it as a weapon and all these things. So, so there's stigma or yeah. not, like depending on where she is, where she lives, how she's working, there's stigma about having different, being differently abled. Uh, I have characters with different, um, with prosthetics and things like that. I myself, you know, don't have all my fingers. I grew up that way. I was born that way. So I know what it's like to experience this weird shock that people treat you like, oh, you're ooh, ooh, other, you know? Um, and so I play with that, you know, I yeah. play with like, wh where's the line? How does she handle it? The, that level of, of discrimination, um, people's behavior. Yeah. All kinds of I things. The, the, the book that I'm going to recommend for our uh, to read pile, I, I actually cheated and started reading this week so i'm getting a little ahead of it but uh mm -hmm. it's uh, marie lou's the young elites and the mm -hmm. protagonist has one eye and uh it's 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 the the kind of thing where and i'm sure you experienced this in the writing of it 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 surprises me as a reader when the character then makes reference to you know uh she's having an emotional moment and she'll say you know i i closed my eye 
Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I blinked the tears out of my eye or, uh, or, you know, the, the, the limits to her peripheral vision end up affecting her in these interesting circumstances. But the rest of the time I, as a reader forget, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's the kind of, it's almost a hidden disability. It's like folks who have, you know, disabilities that are, that are, uh, you know, that are, that don't present in that it's the, the person is, you know, fully functional. They don't seem to be struggling in any way. And then you realize, oh, the, the writer, didn't lose track of this mm -hmm. uh, of this very real important part of this character's uh, you know personality uh, mm -hmm. and you know you're just constantly being reminded oh yeah that's right you know mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Has, has, does that come out in your story where you know her, yeah. her eye then becomes a, a plot point in ways that kind of surprise mm -hmm. the reader I honestly don't know if they surprise the reader no one's told me but yeah I in the first four books I have her eye glitching for various reasons mm. and she doesn't know why and she can kind of tinker with it because she's an engineer um but um it's it's a little bit jarring for her it disrupts her her life and um, and then also it's a strength it allows right. her to do her job in a way that others can't um and it also has kind of heightened some of her abilities to observe people. And in addition to being trained and observing people, then she can actually see all those micro movements that people make without even being aware that might right. indicate they're covering something. She, she I'll, I'll bet the reader has a similar experience to, to I, I've got a close friend who has a glass eye and I don't think I, I forget. Like I yeah. don't think about that at all. And then something will happen and I'll be reminded. And mm -hmm. I'll bet the reader has that same experience reading your work where it's, sure. Oh yeah, I forgot this, but this, that's not because at any point it ceased to be an intrinsic part of this character. It's because mm -hmm. she's become a friend of mine and that's not something I notice until it becomes mm -hmm. relevant, you know? It's, exactly. It's interesting to kind of play with. Yeah, and that's what my friends tell me. And my father was born blind in one eye and he would have a glass eye for a while. And, you know, you're just like, oh, there's dad, right? Um, people are people. And that's partly what I'm writing about as well, you know, and the humanity of us all, good and bad and in the middle. <laughs> you know, um, yes. and, and I want to mention my TBR, my book in my to be re reading pile, which is actually I also started it because I had to read book two. It was at the end of book one. And I I think I put it in the in the list. It's Bubbles in Space. It's book two. Uh, yes. It's Jesus uh, S.C. Jensen, a Canadian writer, really fun. She took She's deeply inspired by Dashiell Hammett and, and those those writers, and she put it into a cyber punk noir future um, where it's really fun. And she she's great, does a great job with the vocabulary, and it, it's really it it feels like you're reading sort of a cross between um, uh, what's that movie with uh, Harrison Ford and the oh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner, yeah. yeah. You feel like you're kind of in a Blade Runner world, but just like with a punk soundtrack overlaid and and the Dashiell Hammett energy of the, you know, of the Maltese Falcon and those kind of things. And um, so, yeah, I just started book two. She's got a cybernetic, she's got a prosthetic arm. She's got some other, and then prosthetic pieces. And then it's like the norm for people to have built in, um, you know, the ability to have like internal screens and, yeah. you know, kind of this high tech world we see in, in a lot of those movies. And, it's fun. It's fast paced. And, um, you know, her, she's wry. She's got a sense of humor, sardonic, and she does the right thing. And uh, even though it's hard, even though it's um, she battered and bruised half the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, I love that that, you know, the, the sci fi noir is a, uh, a rich uh, uh, subgenre. I, I, you know, the book I recommended last week was in that same genre, The Thin mm. Man, which I've not started yet. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to start. And it's it, it looks like I mean, just even the the cover art and the back cover copy. I'm like, this is going to be a cool place to hang out. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And there's like five books I think now in the series, and she's doing a remarkable, beautiful marketing job. I'm so impressed. Um, and yeah. I, and I recently, I also want to give a shout out to um, Kate Johnson's Mac 17 series. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've listed that, but that's kind of like reading Firefly. It's, it's fabulous. It's just so much fun. Very much, um, you know, violent and sexy and dangerous. And the main character, who's, her, her name is Max, just, just fabulous. 
I will uh, add that to the show series. notes. Kate Johnson, what's the name of the series? Uh, Max 17. Okay, that'll be in the show notes for folks yeah. who want to check that out because that does sound very cool. Yeah, if you're a Firefly flan- fan, uh, there's some other comps that she references, but that's that's the big one for me. It just really, uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. So in addition, uh, you know, when we're when we're not on the page, I uh, know you have been watching Bad Batch. Have you been have you caught up to uh, the uh, the most recent mm. episode? No, no, okay. I'm still just a few episodes in. Yeah, Bad Batch. Really, really interesting. I've also been watching some other Star Wars animated um, I think it was called Young Rebels. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, or just uh, Rebels. The Rebels. Uh, Rebels. Rebels. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just started that. I am just super drawn right now to these um, teen animated shows. I I did watch the two seasons of um, uh, Spellbound, Daniel Spellbound. Mm. Really good I writing. Those out yet. Really yeah, good the, writing. The writing is, I mean, oh, yeah. compared to when we were kids and the cartoons were, like, if you go back now as an adult and you look at the cartoons we watched as kids, they treated us with such disdain. They were just like, you're idiots. <laughs> the writing doesn't have to be decent. It, the, the story barely has to make sense. The Transformers are looking for Energon cubes. We're never going to explain why or what those are. They're just things. We don't sell them. So because we can't make profit from it, you know, too bad, kids. And like now the writing is really tight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Really, uh, really good. I loved the... Um... Oh, man, my brain is just spitting on me. Um, the the series about the kids who had the different uh, energy powers, earth, water, air. Kind oh, of, uh, Avatar Asian. The Last Airbender. Yes. yes. I loved oh. Avatar, but I didn't start with Avatar. I started with the other one about the girl. Oh, Korra, the Legend Korra. of Korra, the oh, sequel. I watched that twice. Yeah. First I watched it, then I went back and watched Avatar. Then I watched Korra again. I'm like, oh, now I really understand the relationship. So good. And then they so made good. a live action film, which was terrible. It was like the mm. worst <laughs> film because they didn't get the fact that the protagonist is funny and fun. Oh. They made it so serious. Oh. and. Yeah, right. it's, it is th- those cartoons. And I love the way that they I don't want to spoil it for anybody who's not seen them, but that that's that's a while back. I don't yeah. feel like I'm spoiling too much. But the ending, I think there were four seasons of Avatar. Is Some, that right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the ending was a triumph. And you often yeah. see these shows just kind of trail off. You know, they're not sure if they're going to get re-upped or whatever. And that one really came together in this very intentional and brilliant way uh, that mm-hmm. actually fit the characters. It didn't have to be. You know, yeah. this person kills that person in the end. Like, right. so yeah. totally worth, if folks it's, have not seen Avatar The Last Airbender. Highly, it's highly worth recommended. Your time. Yeah. And I know they're reviving it. Um, I went looking. I'm like, oh, this was so great. Is there any more? And then I saw, oh, they're going to revive it or extend it or, or oh, really? Like that. Yeah. Oh, I'm excited to check that yeah. out because, yeah, those yeah. were really thoughtfully done. They created a beautiful, rich world. Yeah. Uh, these fantastic characters who changed and grew over time. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I really, really liked that. Uh, well, and I, and I don't want to spoil anything about Bad Batch for you, but it starts off like the first episode. I was going, these characters are so rote. They're so the you know, the superhero team. Here's the mm-hmm. strong one. Here's the smart yeah. one. You know, it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then like they have really developed and oh, that's uh, great much better so yeah it's it's and it's also surprisingly adult and when i say adult i don't mean in like it's you know it's not there's there's no sexuality there's you know but the the violence i mean these are you know soldiers the the mm-hmm. quantity of violence but also some really grim slow paced kind of agony that these characters mm. go through that really isn't for kids like these wow. are shows that are for adults uh mm. in many ways and uh and I've, I've appreciated the again the level of respect for the audience mm-hmm. you gotta, mm-hmm. gotta value the people you're creating work for or don't create it you have to yeah. talk about people yeah well one of the things that we've done over here is we've read the book um so you want to so you want to write a bigger no you want to write a bigger story is that what it's called I ask my husband you want to write a bigger story? You're going to write a, write a bigger... we're, Yeah, we're going to need a bigger story. We're going to need a bigger story. Like we're going to need a bigger boat. Nice. Yes. I like it. Yeah. And it's all about how do you build story worlds that are just bigger than just the story. And 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 they always reference Star Wars because they've done just a phenomenal job expanding that world and diving yeah. deep into these secondary characters and um, where you care about them. I mean, 
I, I also watched the shorts where they're little standalone mm -hmm. uh, stories. And I was so touched by how well they did and how nuanced they would get into someone's story. And if you're watching, if you're part of, if you're a fan, then you understand how it all fits together and you cheer for them. And I, I'm just so, so impressed. And it, it's something that, you know, when I'm world building for my own work, I, I go down these little rabbit holes. I write all these little side stories yes. so that I understand when a character walks into the room, who they are, what they want, you know, what's what they just came from, what they're struggling with. Um, and if I haven't done that work by the time I'm finished with a book, you know, my readers will know. So I need to know. And yeah, I, I tell my students, you should have so much more writing than what ends up on the page for your reader, because you need to know this stuff. And the yeah. reader will be able to feel that you are aware of more than you are revealing. That's uh, right. So yeah, we do all so much background, you know, and even yeah. more so in sci-fi fantasy, you know, in genre fiction, where we've got to create a world. That's a yeah. lot. One of the authors I work with, uh, she, uh, it took her 10 years to create the first epic high fantasy book in, in her mm -hmm. series. Now, mm -hmm. the second one took, what, two or three, like, it, yeah. it, you know, uh, because she built this world, but she'd done an incredible amount of work on the lore and the background mm -hmm. so that this thing feels like you really are in this new place that she's created. So yeah. I highly recommend Miko Azul's The Staff of Fire and Bone. Mm. You will read it and go, it is 10, ten years of work when in wow. you know, it's, it's It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I can totally relate to that. I mean, I have a young adult adventure series, Henrietta the Dragon Slayer, and it took me a long time to be feel ready to get book one out. And by then I had started book two and at that much quicker. And I had already started book three, which is like twice the size of book one, you know, and, and by then I had really, I really knew my world. I had a lot more confidence. I could also tell the story from multiple perspectives um, and uh, it was so much fun to to build that. And now I'm I'm actually working on stories with Henrietta, the Dragon Slayer, and her friends in a completely new environment. I wanted to challenge myself. I wanted to get them into a, a place nobody knew, that none of the characters knew, and have them face these monsters and super fun. And then yeah. I have to weave it all together. I'm waiting for my subconscious to like, well, how could all these disparate creatures exist in one landscape? <laughs> you know, I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and some of that figuring it out is stepping away. So, yeah. so uh, when you are not writing, what has been a hobby that's been helping you step out of that world uh, recently? Yeah, well, uh, working on multiple projects is is one thing, right? I'm working on the sci-fi fantasy, I mean, the sci-fi mysteries actively and doing all the science research. And then every once in a while, I'll bump into things that inspire me for, for the fantasy. Um, I would say just like this, I have this hunger to travel, this hunger to travel in my mind and my body, you know, and I'm hopefully going to travel again this summer. I'm looking forward to that, like getting out of the norm yes. and just going to different, even different locations in my town here in my city. Um, and I kind of, I listen to a lot of podcasts or watch videos. It's almost like, I don't know what I'm going to discover. So let's go see what's out there. And you live and, in Oakland, right? I, yep. Yeah. I, I've got family down there, so I'm down there yeah. all the time. And Oakland is such a rich city culturally. You can yeah. go to another neighborhood and you have entered into a different city. Like, it's, Absolutely. It's really great. Yeah, it's so great. Just recently, I remember going somewhere feeling like, oh, it's just, oh, I am I feel like I'm in Thailand. And it's actually just a cafe down the street. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's a Thai family. They, everything, the, the food on the menu is things I've never seen. Oh, they're, they have Thai coffee. They have their specialties, the way they make it. And I feel like, oh, this is great. I didn't have to go very far and I'm already well, my, somewhere Yeah, else. my dad grew up in the Bay Area uh, and he, you know that was how his folks who couldn't afford to travel the world introduced my dad and his brothers to the world was through food. Like, mm -hmm. let's keep trying these other kinds of restaurants in these other neighborhoods, which were not long commutes. You know, we go yeah. a half an hour in this direction. We are getting, try a food that... You know, and so my dad, that was cuisine was mm -hmm. the way that he learned about the world and, and different cultures. Uh, oh, so yeah. you're lucky to be in a city that is that culturally rich. Yeah, it's so, so wonderful. I grew up uh, in uh, Sonoma, but my father worked in San Francisco. And as a teen, I was able to go with him a few times to his job. And he was a salesman, and but he would pop in and out of these delis and this florist on his way to the client. And so he learned how to say please. And thank you in like 10, 15 different languages. Right. And I would walk with him and he would teach me and, ha and he would always, he was very personable. He would like shake their hand and talk to them and have a chat. 
And it, it felt like in the span of an afternoon, I got to go to all these different places with him and I got right. to learn a few different words and languages. And, um, and my dad was very big hearted and it's like wherever he went, he made friends. And yeah. It's wonderful. Which, you know, lends itself to a sales job too. The, oh, the people perfect. Who, you know, yeah, that's, uh, and yeah, my, my dad is the same way. It's amazing. My, my, no matter where we go in the world, he will meet people he has met before. We'll be in an airport and he'll go, oh yeah, there's this person. And he can remember not only the individual, but he'll say like, oh, that's this person. Their daughter just got into Brown. She's studying chemistry. It's she's, she's really sharp. And we're like, wow, how do you possibly remember all, you know, my mom and I are looking at each other going, I have no idea who this person is or how he remembers that. But that's this great skill that, you know, Mm -hmm. has allowed him to connect with so many people over time as he, Mm -hmm. he remembers them. (laughs) It's amazing. That's so cool. That's a wonderful skill to have. Oh, that would be a good character to have in a story. <laughs> yeah, somebody who can remember, you know, I, I, yeah, just th- those folks who have that ability. It's mm-hmm. I, I envy it. I do not have. That. I tell my students very openly, you know, you're going to graduate, and I'm going to meet you in ten years, and I will not remember your name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will still yeah. care about you. I will be uh-huh. excited to hear about your, you know, uh, your new spouse and your beautiful children. Mm-hmm. And names are going to vanish from my mind. Please don't test me on them in 10 years. I'll feel, you know, you're just going to create an awkward situation. Uh, I, yeah. I get, you know, I've taught thousands of students now. I do not remember their names. <laughs> yeah, I, I can relate. But I can remember someone if they start to tell me about their story. Because mm-hmm. I'm a, a writing teacher. If they start to tell me their story, I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'll well, remember you. I find that I'm much better with faces. And the mm-hmm. really tough thing was uh, COVID during the lockdowns. Mm-hmm. We allowed our students to keep their cameras off. And there was a lot of debate about that. Can can you keep mm-hmm. students engaged if their cameras are off? But on the other hand, are you if they're if their camera's off, if their cameras, if we're forcing them to have them on, are we invading their homes? Right. You know? uh, uh, and yeah. so there, there some schools I know chose to keep cameras on. We chose to allow students to decide, which means a lot of students chose to have them off. And what I found is I had a really hard time connecting with a lot of those students. You know, now we're back in school years later and they swing mm-hmm. by my room and say, I took your class. And I'm like, and I don't know who you are. Oh, yeah, right. I did read your essay, but I uh-huh. don't remember you because I don't know your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. My husband had the same problem. Yep. Yeah. He's a high school teacher. And yeah, I think everybody had their camera off, which yeah. also had its benefit, meaning like there's a certain freedom he had and we had here because at the house. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it was it was it was a very strange time. <laughs> yeah, very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's take an ad break here. Uh, okay. We'll get Doug to fire up the ad break music. And thank you, Doug. And uh, we will get going on that. And then when we come back, we'll talk about what you've been daydreaming about recently. Thanks, Doug. Hey, everybody. Today's ad is for ads. If you're an indie author, you know how hard it is to get the word out about your books. Well, you could advertise on this show for less than 20 bucks. Just go to notapipepublishing.com. Click on the link for the show and sign up. You can also sign up to be a guest. That's always free. And we can try to time your ad or episode to match a book launch or a cover reveal or your birthday or a marriage proposal or the anniversary of a famous battle or the predicted return of a dead celebrity or profit or the... Live show announcement. We'll be at Norwescon in Seattle, April 6th to 9th. The guests are to be announced. We'd love to have you in the live audience. Bring some fun questions to ask a panel of procrastinating authors. Okay, Doug, teleport us back to the show. Thank you very much, Doug. So Beth, what have you been daydreaming about recently? I, I've been daydreaming about uh, meeting new people and uh, finding new solutions to new problems or uh, new solutions to old problems uh, and how to bring storytelling into new environments, uh, into new um, situations. Uh, I'm passionate about thinking about the earth as, as a globe. I, I spent a lot of my time watching launches and looking at beautiful astrophotography and James Webb photography and Hubble and um, Earth from Space. I love that. I have a ton of screensavers on my computer yeah. where I get to see that all the time. And I'm I think about well, how do I convey that and how do I share that um, fascination that I have, that awe that I have, 
uh, through through story. So it all comes back to story. I, I don't really have um, daydreams that aren't connected <laughs> somehow <laughs> to story in some way. Um, yeah. No, I, I I am in the same boat. I I find that I am almost religious about the power of narrative, if that makes sense. Like mm-hmm. I believe that our brains are hardwired for story, regardless of whether the story is true. You know, regardless of whether there is causality, we will create it because we want story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes that trips us up, but I think there is something that is unifying in recognizing that, you know, part of what makes us human is our need to understand the story of the world around us uh, and our own life experience and the stories of others and how those are interconnected. So, yeah, I, I love thinking about how our, you know, we are characters and we are creating a plot structure. <laughs> Absolutely. And because I'm working in a lot of different stories, so not just my own, but my clients, and also I edit my husband's work, it's like I feel like I'm going from room to room, visiting different stories and different structures and different, you know, there's different things that underpin different stories. So I guess another part thing that I daydream about is like, what is the operating principle for those different stories and those different people inside those stories and real people? What are the, What's driving them? What's their operating principles? And how do I and what are mine? And so it's like this excavation that mm-hmm. happens and um makes me just it's kind of relativistic in a way like everything's related to everything else and also things have all these different points and different perspectives that aren't uh connected or aren't seemingly connected so i'm just it's almost like i catalog things and observe them and i don't always have an answer i don't always know what it is yet so there's a lot of suspension of of like well i don't have the answer i just have some information i just yeah. have you know and it's I don't know. It's a kind of a playful space too. Cause I'm also like juggling lots of different ideas and waiting for things to settle. And <laughs> yeah, it's, no, I'm, yeah. I'm in the same boat. I've been yeah. thinking a lot about how do I, th- this impulse that I have as I'm crafting stories to increase the tension is natural, right? We want our stories to be more exciting as they go, but I've been pushing against my own impulse to say tension is violence and so how can I create stories that are cozier, you know, oh. that are, that are, and, and mm. that's been a, a real tension for me because the, you know, the, the stakes don't have to be, and, and this will lead to bloodshed. Right. Uh, and, you know, and so how do I not put uh, project more violence into the reader's world uh, mm. and still keep the reader engaged? Uh, and and that's, that that's hard, I think for, I don't know about for you, but for me, a lot of my stories end up, there ends up being some kind of physical violence. And it's, you know, I've been stepping back and kind of reflecting Mm. on that and saying, my my Mm. life is not full of physical violence. Mm -hmm. So what what am I, what am I projecting into the world in an effort to create tension that Mm -hmm. might actually be unhealthy? So that's, that's something I've been thinking about. That's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I watch a lot of cozy, cozy mysteries. I mean, usually someone does die though. Or, well, they, usually there's know, a death, but then yeah. a lot of it, the tension isn't, you know, then there's more bloodshed no. within the story. No, it's know? about, it's about who done it, why done it, and uh, what's really going on. And, um, and also secrets, right? Secrets hold tension. And should a secret be revealed? I have one of my characters right now in the work, I know, in the work in progress, he's, he doesn't he wants to ask her an important question to move the relationship forward, but he hasn't gotten the courage yet. And so I reveal his, his angst about it and his questioning himself. Like, why can't I do this? Um, I'm so brave in all these other areas of my life. Why here? And um, why am I not brave here? You know? So the way people hold back, the way people also kind of say inappropriate things too. And then the consequences of that, or, uh, because I work with over long distances in my stories, I'm, it's like the distance that you have from the loved ones also is attention. Yeah, I guess I, I do play with that a lot. Yeah, and I want that more in mm. my writing. The the mm. you know the 
the tension of the thing not said Mm -hmm. uh, is can be just as suspenseful as you know there's somebody waiting around the corner with a machete exactly is this character going to be able to find the courage to say this thing that's hard Mm -hmm. and that has emotional weight and so i'm trying to work on infusing my writing with more of that kind of tension Mm. and less of the you know the, the, the this is I was talking to my my brother about uh, today he's going to see Ant-Man, the newest Ant-Man. And we were talking mm-hmm. about how much we liked the first one, because unlike so many of the other Marvel movies where the stakes are, if this goes badly, the entire world ends. Mm-hmm. The stakes were, can he get, can he reconnect with his daughter? Uh-huh. And it was just as we were just as emotionally invested mm-hmm. when the stakes were intimate as we were when they were, you know, global. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so that I think is... There needs to be some some healthy, you know, combination, and I haven't found it yet. My my books do tend to, you know, if this doesn't go well, the world ends. Like, how can I find uh-huh. that? No, if this doesn't go well, this character doesn't get to have the relationship that they want to have with this sibling or significant other or whatever. How mm-hmm. can I find that kind of tension? So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, yeah, there's a lot to play with there. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's about identity and. If we don't get, you know, like an Ant Man, if he doesn't get to be the father that he so yearns to be, you know, then who, then who is he? Right. And then what kind of man is he? And that goes right to self, sense of self, self identity, which is core. So if we don't have a sense of identity, then we're we're like ah, you know, we're we're lost. And it and really he, is existential. Instead of the world mm-hmm. has ended, my world has ended because I don't know who I am in the world. And yeah. so recognizing that the, the stakes really are just as high. Mm-hmm. It just, it comes you know about in a different way. And so I think yeah. that's helpful for, but we're getting too close to process. Um, oh, are we? But also <laughs> we're kind of touching on one of my favorite things to think about, which is how humans are wired. Yeah. Like you touched on, we're wired for story. We're also wired for so many, for survival, for identity stability, you know, and so I spend time actually listening to videos and thinking about this, talking with friends around these inner workings and how humans are connected to each other and to themselves. And it's 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 so fascinating because we aren't born un- with that level of self-awareness and right. it's only through we get to cultivate it. So I guess you would say that self-awareness and self-discovery and human evolution is is one of my hobbies as well. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and the same here. And thinking about the ways that our predispositions toward survival, toward preserving an identity, can betray us. Mm-hmm. You know, is an interesting thing to play mm-hmm. with in our in our writing. And it's also interesting to think about when you're looking at the the world around us. Yeah, you know, to what extent are people saying this new change? is scary to me simply because it doesn't fit into the schema that I understand. And so I, Mm -hmm. you know, I I know a lot of folks who are struggling to adapt to a world where, you know, we we are accepting of trans people. And it's not because they are saying, I recognize, I see myself as hateful. They're saying, because this is new to me. Right. And I just don't like this thing that's new. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, how do I give somebody grace to say, I understand this is new and scary to you. And mm-hmm. also not say, I'm going to give you so much grace that I'm going to allow you to be hateful to this person who is trying to live their life. You know, that right. is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very real tension. That's interesting. I find that trans people actually are more gracious to the fact that people are struggling than mm-hmm. somebody like me watching it from the outside saying, why can't you just tolerate this person, the, you know, mm-hmm. and accept and love this person as they are? Yeah. Um, because they're working on a timeline and they, mm. you know, this might be new and hard for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and maybe I, I lived abroad when I was 16 and I got to meet people from all over the world, which had been a dream of mine since I was like 13. And there's something about being with people from all different cultures mm-hmm. and starting to feel like, you know, there's so many different ways of being in the world. There's not just one way. It's very easy when we're just in our hometown and these are the people we know and this is our family and this is our school. We think that is the world. But actually, mm-hmm. yeah, everybody's got that those things and they the way they proceed with them is different. And and so you know, like I yearn, one of my other hobbies is Paris and France and French and being in Europe and um, just being in a different environment where the history is different and the food is different and how people get from here to there is different. And and then you realize, well, we're all the same, but we're also all different. <laughs> and I just love that tension and that dichotomy. It makes me feel alive, actually. Yeah. It helps me feel like, oh, it's my one way is not the way. And thank God, you know. 
Yeah. Because I'm kind of boring. I mean, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> Same here. Yes. Small town English teacher. My life is not that interesting. <laughs> but, but you know, I, I take students to, you know, I've taken students to Europe a handful of times. And the, one of the wonderful things about that experience is I share with them, you're going to notice kind of superficial differences first. And then eventually, as we are there, you'll start to notice some of those deeper cultural differences uh, in the way people communicate, the way people interact, the expectations. This is just, and the people you will be meeting have that same attitude of, but this is just the way everyone is, right? And so that creates this, you know, interesting dynamic between mm -hmm. my students who are going, oh, um, the world could be different. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. it really, I, I've gotten to watch it, these students' minds just be blown not by the superficial stuff, not by, oh, you know, an, an outlet can have a different number of prongs, but like at the, at that's where it starts, you know, and then mm -hmm. it gets significantly deeper where they start to realize, oh, the kind of verbal patterns, uh, even when this person is a, a fluent English speaker are different because of an underlying cultural difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then how do you, okay, I have to take it back to storytelling because my passion is like, how do I build cultures um, that are different, that make, that change my main character. And through the course of what she's doing, I mean, there's a cross-cultural exchange and I realized I'm passionate and have been passionate about it since I was 16 of this, this cross-cultural connections and exchange and how we influence each other. And what I was talking about earlier about like how do different countries make strategic decisions about their space programs? Well, that's a cross-cultural communication. Right. How do we translate the way China operates versus the way the U.S. operates? How do we change the culture in the U.S. actually? And it, I've seen, I'm starting to see the things that I was hoping for is starting to shift inside our own space industry. And, you know, and how can I be a force of cultural change? Because that's right. what I feel like fiction, our stories are doing. Um, yeah, I mean, I love watching British cozy mysteries because I feel like I get to go into another culture dealing with some core human things that we all deal with. And at the same time, the way they go about it is different yeah. than the way we reveal our mysteries here in our storytelling processes. So <clears throat> it's, I just love that stuff. Yeah. Well, and our culture is so young and so diverse that, you know, getting to spend time in something like a British cozy mystery where the culture is, you know, older and more clearly understood by the, you know, all the various participants. This is the way we are. There's a clearer sense, I think, in England and France of this is, this is the way people ought to be. And yet it's also limiting, like yeah. they ought to be like us. And, the, yeah. you know, and so, yeah, yeah. and we don't have quite that. Uh, you yeah. know, we certainly have our, our entrenched sense of this is the way we ought to live our lives, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are more diverse and we are younger just as a culture. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, as writers, we get to present people with an opportunity to get off the porch and yeah. <laughs> see something different. And I think that's really healthy. I, I love it. I love it. So your mm -hmm. uh, next book probably won't come out for a while. What's one thing you want listeners to know about right now in terms of how to connect with you? Oh, sure. So the first book in the series is called Into the Black, and it is available. Uh, it's a great entry point into the series, into the Janie McAllister mystery series. She is a lead investigator on a hotel casino space station, leading her first team. And of course, problems ensue. So I highly recommend that. If you uh, want to get on my list, you can go and get the book for free. Go to my website, oh. author.bethbarani.com and find free books and navigate to uh, Into the Black. Or Very cool. And I will put all that in the show notes. So folks who yeah. are watching or listening will be able to yeah, it's one click away. Well, two clicks, because first go to the website and get yourself a free copy and get into the mm -hmm. series. That's that's right. That's that's right. That's, that's very generous of you. <laughs> that's really well, cool. It's it's there because, you know, it's it's a great entry point. Right. And if they like that book, then you'll get the rest. And book five is coming hopefully by the end of 2023. Oh, that's exciting. Um, yeah, well, hope so. Yeah. Do you have a title or is that still no title? No, no title just, yet. Yes. No title. It's going to be no title probably until I'm in the revision process right now. It's just Janie book five. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's thought. very cool. Yeah. Well, that's It's nice for folks to be looking forward to Janie yeah. book five too. Yeah. 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 And um, I'm very proud of the first four books. Book one, one uh, was a finalist in the page Turner awards and 
congratulations. Uh, that yeah. is cool. I, I love that idea of a setting, the, uh, the, the space casino. I, there, um, Curtis Chen has one of his uh, kangaroo, his kangaroo series. The second in the series takes place on a space casino and it's really fun. So because I love that so much, I'll have to go check out the whole series because, you know, yeah. I, I want to spend the uh, five books in that in that space. Yeah, well, I should let you know the book five is a departure. Book five is not is on a different space station. Ah. And my, yeah, so, yeah. But once you get people sucked yeah. in, then I'm just going to want to go wherever Janie. Yeah, is, so. that's right. And she's going to go to space stations because she's a space station investigator. So we'll see where where she will go. Uh, I'm excited to share with everyone. Yeah, this new adventure. Well, one of the things we do on the show is we have a weekly poll. And uh, so, for example, last week we uh, uh, had uh, Francis Lupai Polito suggested this one that was really interesting. It was if you could pick between two powers, not for yourself, but a superpower to give your arch enemy, knowing you would be in conflict with this person in the future, which would you give? And the options were uh, the ability to change the density of an object to make something as you know, as as dense as lead or as light as a feather, or the ability to talk to animals, which would you give to that other person? Uh, and uh, the results were interesting. I, I made kind of an argument, uh, probably prematurely, and skewed things a little bit. I think I put an elbow on the scale and said, "Well, just because you you know have to con you know talk to the animals doesn't mean they're necessarily going to obey." So I would much rather my arch nemesis have to be conversing with animals about how to harm me. If, on the other hand, the power were they had to convince inanimate objects to harm me, that, that would even things out. So uh, talk to animals did win handily in that one, uh, 77 mm -hmm. to 22 percent. So people were well, that's the one people wanted to give to their their arch uh, nemesis. So what is a poll we should ask for uh, from our, our listeners this next week? Uh, OK, so I revealed I'm not so great at this kind of thing, but. I just picked the first thing because I'm such a fangirl um, between Star Wars, Star Trek, Firefly and Farscape. I think that's a great question. And the 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 I would like your input on how to word it, because I think one of the things that makes a big difference here is, are we saying which one would you like to watch or which one would you want to live in? Ooh, let's do that one. Which one would you like to live in? Yeah, I think that's yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a more interesting one because that is more interesting. You know, there there are uh, you know th these are all fun to watch from a safe distance, <laughs> but uh, there are some that I would certainly yeah. not want to live. But like Farscape could be hilarious and also incredibly dangerous. <laughs> oh yeah, I. Do I need to weigh in on this? I don't want to like skew folks. <laughs> Feel free. Yeah. Where would you, if you, if you were thinking about which to um, actually live in, which would you prefer? Star Trek. Me too, because it's, you don't have to, you could live in France on a vineyard. And yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's so many different worlds inside of Star Trek and many of them are safe and interesting and adventurous. And yeah, there's risk being on a starship, but you're, trained for it and you you sign up for that life um i i think firefly would probably firefly and farscape would be dangerous um especially i feel like living on the crew of firefly would be really precarious it's and fraught yeah they're, they're they're like hanging by a thread all the time and farscape has got so many weird uh political mach machinations that it's almost like you don't really know where you stand. It could, yeah. things could switch. Also the disasters, the level of disasters on there is so bizarre. Uh, and then, I mean, I think Star Wars would be dangerous too, right? You've got, it seems like in every single world and story they've presented, there's always, there's always the evil empire of some one form or another and a whole, it's like, they could swoop in out of nowhere and say, this is our planet now. <laughs> right. Or destroy your whole planet, you know, right. you can just be right. living your life and then your planet's incinerated. So yeah, that that's scary. Yeah. 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 And it seems like Star Trek's the most sanitized. I mean, it has its issues and problems and depending on where you live and, um, but for the most part, at least we're presented with a world where it's about fulfilling your potential. I, I have heard a theory that what Roddenberry was really exploring with Star Trek was a economic utopia. What happens when we no longer have 
need in terms of material need. If you could Mm -hmm. just have the food and clothing that you need, uh, what would people still do? And so Mm -hmm. that's, you know, then it becomes about exploration because that's how you achieve fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just about acquiring stuff, the stuff could just be made by a replicator. That's (laughs) right. That's That's right. And so I think that is certainly living in a world without, you know, uh, physical scarcity and instead having Mm -hmm. to achieve via exploration and bravery and that kind of thing, or to be satisfied and learn Mm -hmm. to be content, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, on some world where you are just creating art, (laughs) you know, I think that sounds wonderful. That sounds great. I mean, uh, the Orville also, I mean, which is an homage to Star Trek, they, they actually touch on that, on, on being able to once, once the earth had the replicator, then, you know, everything changed, everything changed. I mean, if we didn't have to go to work, what would you do? Yeah. You no. Know, how would you choose to spend your day? And, you know, I, I think about that a lot, actually. And I, I think about putting it in story, but I also think about uh, what am I doing what I would be doing if I didn't have to be doing it? And my answer is yes, actually, because I've been at this long enough that I'm like, I'm doing this no matter what, you know, I've done it during you know, after 9-11, after 2016 elections, after the breakdown, you know, the economic whatever it was in 20, 2008, like as an adult, I've always come back to writing and yeah. I've been challenged by it many times by many things and and both emotionally, economically. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm doing this. It's my form of protest. What was yeah. I doing? In 2016, in the fall, I was starting the series, actually. I was, that was my form of protest. I'm like, politics over there. If I am not writing, then I'm not do- putting my voice into the world. And how could I, that's my way. It's my way that's of being active. Me too. I mean, we actually put out an anthology that was short fiction of people kind of processing their the, the, the rise of fascism. And so giving people an opportunity to lift up their voices, I felt was the best thing I could do. Yeah. Uh, we're, we've got an anthology coming out this summer that's exclusively by LGBTQIA plus authors. Mm-hmm. I am not on the editorial team because as a straight guy, that would be inappropriate. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you know, being the facilitator, that was how I spent all my day yesterday was creating the mm-hmm. interior file for this fantastic anthology that's oh, going to be uh, coming out this summer. But, you know, giving people an opportunity to raise their voices and to mm-hmm. feel that they're to, to you know, recognize that their voices are valued, uh, I think is so Absolutely. important. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a writing teacher, I feel every time I walk into a room to teach virtually or online, like your I, that's what I tell the students, like your story matters, your mm-hmm. voice matters, your unique take on the, the world matters. And with this diversity mm-hmm. of voices comes a new kind of way of being in the world. And we need that. We're hungry for it. We're all so hungry for it. Yeah. And so that drives me both as a teacher and as a writer, because who knows what's going to come out of my mouth next? I don't. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. We're, and, and, you know, beyond our, our, our physical experience, who knows what worlds we'll create in our heads that mm-hmm. we can then share with the rest of the you know, the world, the, the the world outside of our heads and welcome people into. I, that's that's exciting to me that, you know, it, it, it's that our stories matter because we are, through our imaginations, able to exponentially magnify our experience. Uh, mm, well, that's well said, yeah. And that's why you're a publisher, I imagine. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. yeah. And also, I don't, th- there are more stories that I want in the world than I could possibly write. So how mm. can I facilitate other writers to, uh, mm-hmm. and support them to, provide me with the wonderful literature that I enjoy. (laughs) Oh, that's so great. What a great mission. So uh, where can listeners find you and when they're looking for you and your work? Yeah. So Beth Barani on all the vendors, author.bethbarani.com. Or if you forget that and you just go to bethbarani.com, that's awesome. Just click on books. Uh, I hang out on Twitter at Beth Barani and LinkedIn at Beth Barani. I have presence in the other zones, but don't interact that much there. Um, yeah. 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 I, I will make sure all those are in the, uh, the show page as well so that folks can find your work. Um, so as we wrap up, there's a whole bunch of folks I have to thank. Uh, I want to thank the artist, Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for our intro, the song, I prefer the dusk. Let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter at Max Oakland. Uh, thanks to Halizna CCO for their song Kids for the ad break. 
If you're in a band and would like your song used on the show, I would love to highlight a listener's work like Max's song, so email that to me. Thanks, as always, to Doug, the producer, for making this show sound good and taking the blame when it doesn't. I appreciate that, Doug. <laughs> and I cannot forget to mention Writers Not Writing is a production of Not A Pipe Publishing. So please go to notapipepublishing.com and check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. If you like this show, rate and review it wherever you found it. And please check out Beth's books, Into the Black, and other books in the Janie McAllister sci-fi mystery series. Rate and review those too. Even a very short review and a single click on that fifth star makes a huge difference to Beth, to authors. Really uh, make her day. Take three minutes. Uh, that would be a, a wonderful gift. Um, and I'm too old to say smash that like button without sounding ridiculous, but if you could... Gently tap on the like button for this show. I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, and so that brings us to our send off. There are five things that Beth and I would like you to remember this week. Beth, you want to share your first three? Love your life, play a game, kiss your loved ones. And fourth, in life as in writing, it's the spaces between the words that make it all meaningful. So don't ignore the spaces. And fifth, no matter how much you procrastinate, we're still proud of you. Yes, we are. My time I'm